Perfect. Okay. Um, and lastly, on our presentation team, we have Rory. Um, Rory has also been with us through since the beginning of the project. Um, Rory is a geospatial, um, senior geospatial analyst, and he's also the Youth Mappers Activity Manager from USA Geo Center as well. Um, and he's going to take us through the community assessment um, asset mapping and engagement um, component tailored to crop mapping project. Um, and we believe that students uh, will have an opportunity to um, curiously engage um, and also ask as many questions as possible as how we're going to be able to execute this um, during um, this project. Um, with that, um, I guess I'll hand it over to Lisa. Yep, and I actually can start with a little bit of an icebreaker. So just give me a Great. second to share my screen. Oh, oh gosh. Stella, can you um, enable me to share my screen? Sure. Okay, let me try again, maybe. No, okay. You should be able to share. Okay, let me try again. Yeah, okay, I'm good now. Okay. So I don't know if you all have played Kahoot before, but this is going to be a very short game where we are going to answer a few questions about the material that you'll see today. And if you don't know the answers, that's okay, because these are things we're gonna be learning. Um, so I actually don't know how to get back into the chat, Stella, but if we could, here we go. If you could go to www.kahoot.it, and then you're going to answer, or to put in the game pin which is 9114553. And I just put both of those pieces of information in the chat. So I'm gonna give you guys a minute to go to W, oh, I spelled Kahoot wrong on the, on the chat. Kahoot.it. Okay, Kahoot.it and enter 9114553. And if you can't do this, that's okay. It's only gonna take us a few minutes. So you're not gonna be um, bored for too long and you'll still learn something. Wait, <laughs> who's number one influence? <laughs> Um, okay. I'm going to give it just a, one more minute, Stella. This can eat into my presentation time. All right. Uh, yeah, I'll be patient. Awesome. Okay. Oh, we still got people. We still got a few people coming in. Yeah. Guys, please <laughs> sign in. Let's play oh, this one. Yeah. <laughs> Noonie entered the waiting room, it says. Oh, I can I can admit it. I guess I shouldn't do that in case there's bots coming. Okay. Do, do, do. Give you all 10 more seconds to enter. So. Okay, we're, we're going to start. So if you've never played this before, there's going to be a question and you're just going to click on your phone or your screen what you think the answer is. If you're faster than other people, that helps. So which crop is 
them out of these uh, four pictures on your phone. Whoa, it all looks like so good. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> Oh, looks like Ooh, very good, guys. Yeah. All right, Lisa, if you want to come off mute and talk about this for a second. Yeah, let's talk about this a minute. <laughs> uh, so, so I'm really impressed that the majority of you found the right crop. And one thing that was a hint that it was um, sorghum or matama. Uh, am I saying that correctly? You guys are going to have to correct my Swahili. Oh my goodness, it's not very good. Um, but uh, but yeah, is the fact that the tops of each of the plants in the photo were very bushy. They almost looked like a little um, tree. See, I'm originally from Colorado, and so to me, that looks like a blue spur spruce tree. And I don't know if you guys have those. Um, Maybe it kind of looks like a bow bow tree, mm, maybe, but I'm just talking about the very top where all that grain is. Um, if it's a little broader, a little fluffier, um, that usually is a hint that it's sorghum uh, rather than um, the right two images where the tassel at the top were very thin and, and sparse. Um, and the bottom left image, that's actually rice. Um, so, you know, in some versions of that photo, you can kind of see the ground. You can see that there's a lot of wetness that the crop is in, good sign of rice. Um, and so, so that's just a little bit about these four photos um, and crop identification, uh, looking at these photos. Thanks. Awesome. All right, so now we're going to go to another question. And the good news about this question is every both answers are right. So I just want to gauge your, um, oh, sorry, there's a scoreboard. All right, player. <laughs> <It's okay laughs> right now. All right, so next question, both answers are right. I just want to gauge, have you ever used Kobo Toolbox? Oh, oh, great. Okay, eight people have, three people haven't. I'll be giving a really short intro to Kobo Toolbox, but also specifically how we're going to be using it for this um, crop data identification project and some of the best practices. So hopefully all of you will get something out of my little presentation and a little lesson that I'm gonna give today. Uh, last question. There is one right answer for this. What does PGIS stand for? Yes, the right answer is pizza GI. <laughs> Rory, do you wanna come on? <laughs> I was about to say, can we cheat for them? And Lisa just did. Uh, um, yeah, great job, everyone. Uh, participatory GIS is the right answer, and most of you got it. Good job. All right. So now we're going to just look at who won, and then we'll hand it over to Lisa in third place. Rem? Player? Oh, no, player. You got surpassed. Shabani. Shabani. Okay, um, I'll pass it over to Lisa now. Thanks for participating, guys. Sure, that's awesome. Um, let's see if we're gonna, there we go. Set up our screen for a moment. Uh, once I start sharing my slides, I won't necessarily be able to see the chat. So, um, you know, feel free to, let me, sorry, feel free to let me know if people are putting questions into the chat and I'm always happy to explain a little further. Um, my name is Lisa Coulson 
as Stella mentioned, I, I am a geographer with the International Production Assessment Division. We're a small team um, that is involved in crop production estimates with the foreign with USDA's Foreign Agricultural Service. So this um, presentation today, what we want to do is provide kind of a high level overview, a, a brief introduction to this aspect of the Foreign Agricultural Services work. And the purpose of that is to give you some background on like why we decided to do this project. So USAID approached the Foreign Agricultural Service, specifically my colleague who's joined us today, Luke Nye, uh, asking if, if we have any ideas on how youth mappers could get involved in collecting agricultural data or, or do some sort of agricultural project. And Luke was very kind to, to reach out to our division and ask if we had any ideas about this. And so what I'm sharing with you today is, is our ideas about this, kind of the work we do, how it leads to producing agricultural statistics using remote sensing data, and what does it mean to contribute agricultural information to a remote sensing project. Now, we're not the only ones involved in this. Um, so again, I'm giving you a high level overview uh, so that you can understand kind of the 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 field at play that your work would contribute to, um, but it's not just contributing to one institution by any means. There's a lot of different um, players involved in in this type of work, and so um, I'll I'll hint at that as well. Even though I want to mostly you know introduce myself and give you an idea of of our work, so that's a picture of me. I'm Lisa Colson. Um, I got my master's degree in geography from George Washington University, um, mostly out of convenience. This is where I live. It's a great university as well. Um, but I'm originally from Colorado. I love to travel. And this picture is, is me uh, traveling through some agricultural fields to do similar to work to what we'll be doing together um, for those of you who are joining us in, in Arusha. Uh, for, for that specific project, I was in the United States uh, making, taking yield samples from a variety of fields, uh, and, and our project will be a little different than that, but we're, we're leveraging that experience and the experience of the rest of my team. I, I work with a great group that will inform kind of our approach to this project. Uh, but let me first give you a little more information about who we are and what we do. So USDA produces uh, a report that's called the World Agricultural Supply and Demand Estimates. And this report is created through a multi-agency process that's coordinated by the World Agricultural Outlook Board. Now, now that Agricultural Outlook Board has both economic and meteorological and analysts on their staff. So meteorology is just a fancy term for the studying of weather. You know, crops need rain to grow. Um, they're sensitive to different temperature fluctuations. They want the right kind of soil moisture. So we're always paying attention to the weather to see how the crops are doing. Um, there are other agencies, the, the first one, NAS is our domestic agency, um, and, and all of those other agencies contributing to this process with statistical, economic, and market analysis information. And then the Foreign Agricultural Service, the agency that I'm wor with, um, we're providing trade estimates um, as well as production estimates. Uh, and this happens through a, um, a larger group process. We have a global network of 95 offices overseas contributing uh, reports that feed into Washington, D.C., and then continue our economic and GIS and remote sensing assessments with that information. Um, why do we go through all of this? So if you look at the box on the right, you'll see that a lot of national governments produce 
economic indicators. And we have in the United States, we have different departments who, who are responsible for things like the gross domestic product, right? You've heard of GDP, you've heard of um, various employment statistics like what is your unemployment rate? What, what is the number of jobs that were created in the last month or the last year? Um, different departments produce those federal economic indicators. And when it comes to agriculture, USDA is responsible for those numbers. Um, okay, so let's keep that in mind as we proceed. Um, we're responsible for sharing these numbers on a monthly basis. So um, most of the, the numbers come out in a variety of ways. Um, the, the highlight of the most relevant and, and salient numbers that kind of have changed in the last month or in the last year, they come out in our WASD report. Um, there's an example of that on the left. And that report is relatively brief, but it's full of numbers. And it's about um, all major crop producing countries of the world. Um, so while the report highlights the, the most relevant information uh, that someone might wanna see um, if they're routinely monitoring these, this information, we're actually looking at all countries, all major crop producing countries and, and importer and exporter countries. And um, all of the data gets refreshed every month in our production supply and distribution database. So, so the database gets released, the WASD gets released, and a variety of other reports get updated at the same time. Um, so you can see an example of our report, World Agricultural Production on the far right. Now, these reports, as I said, they come out on, on a monthly basis, and they're all released at the exact same time. We have to release them sometime between the 8th and the 12th of every month at noon. Um, we're not allowed to release them at 11.58 or 12.02. Like, like we have um, a system in place where, where there's one button that gets pushed and everything comes out at the exact same time. And in part, that's because of this data has um, significant importance in the world. It impacts global commodity markets and prices. Um, we take we, we are aware of this and we take that very seriously, which is why it's an interagency process that um, negotiates and, and determines the final estimates each month. Um, the data is used by private traders, uh, other governments, and international organizations. So we take it um, serious that we're providing unbiased information to help level the playing field for all involved. In agriculture, you have not only the farmers, but you also have people getting their product to market and you have others involved in international trade of those products. And through the coordinated efforts of everybody involved in agriculture, um, it helps us have greater food security. And so that's a, a high level perspective on why we do the work we do and the importance of it. Um, the other thing that's kind of fun to point out is uh, there was a movie that came out in the 1980s. So maybe you've been looking at this picture of Dan Aykroyd and Eddie Murphy going, what in the world is this doing on my slide? Um, well, uh, you know, as I mentioned, People involved in commodity trading pay attention to our report. And this movie is a very funny look at, um, at that process. There's a whole bunch of people in uh, New York City on Wall Street waiting for a report to come out, trying to decide what they want to do. Are they, you know, is, are the estimates gonna go up or down? Should we invest more stock into, you know, one commodity market versus a different commodity market? And they're hoping to make a lot of money. Um, so the movie's called Trading Places, if you wanna check it out. I actually watched it growing up. And, and so I'm really shocked that now I work with a team 
that um, was influenced and kind of highlighted in this movie in, in a minor way. Um, it's, it's hilarious to me anyways. Um, but so I mentioned that FAS as a whole, you know, we're looking at imports, exports, consumption, um, uh, how much is stored. Um, and, but I work with a group called the International Production Assessment Division, or iPad for short. We're not the tablet that many of you might own, or we're, um, we're crop assessors. And we, um, we look at just your, your crop commodities. So, so other people in FAS are looking at livestock and fruits and vegetables, but we're looking at your field crops. So um, grains, oil seeds, and cotton um, predominantly. And so um, this is just a few highlighted photos of those, of many of those crops that we focus on. And when we're doing our analysis, um, we consider ourselves an all sources shop. So you can see in the box on the left that we use satellite imagery, weather data, as I mentioned before, it's very important. Um, we use official data from national governments and um, our own experience traveling abroad and uh, collecting data, uh, we call that crop travel. And then we have overseas um, foreign service officers who are working and responsible for their countries and providing attache reports. And so we get information from a wide variety of sources and our regional commodity analysts um, pursue their convergence of evidence methodology to then provide independent and unbiased estimates of global crop production. As I mentioned, those uh, estimates come out in a variety of reports. Um, the one that's most known is the WASDE, but also our World Agricultural Production Report to me is more interesting. It includes a lot of graphs and charts, um, and it includes a little description of why the numbers have changed either in the past month or between last year and this year. Usually that's what we're highlighting. Um, and so you get a little more contextual information as to what's happening with the crop and why the numbers are changing. Hey, Lisa, there's two questions. Okay, sure. Let's take is, a break. Yeah. Is anyone estimating cassava? Cassava. Cassava. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Um, so I know that uh, we have a sugar group and I think cassava is a very similar type of crop. So that might be in their area of, of responsibility. Um, so I have seen some ca cassava information. I'm under the impression we're not, um, it's not one of, I know my group, it's not one of our target crops. So I'd have to talk with my colleagues to ask them more information about that. And I could follow up um, and yeah. share some more information if you guys would like. Janet Chapman's asking that. And then they're also asking how reliable are these official estimates? Oh, that is the 800 pound gorilla type question, right? <laughs> Part of me feels like um, one of the reasons why a lot of different institutions are involved in this game uh, of, of estimating the crops is because it's, um, it, it's important information, you know, that not only provides us with a, a mechanism for food security, right? Because if through these reports you're learning, you know, for example, there's a war in Ukraine um, and that they're, they might not be able to produce as much wheat as they usually do, um, other countries can kind of uh, adjust their policies or encourage their farmers to produce more grain to try to augment that global supply. And so you, you get a lot of international negotiations that help try to um, ensure that we all have food security. As you can tell, um, you know, it's an imperfect system. These things are not, you know, we're, we're always working towards 
um, providing the best supply, I believe, altruistically, that globally, uh, we're all working towards providing um, the best crop we can and ensuring that the trade allows food to get to the people who need it, um, but it's an imperfect system, right? Well, because food is so important to us, um, there's a lot of groups out there also producing crop estimates. And um, usually what they're doing is basing their work on how well they estimated in comparison to the numbers we release, um, to the WASD numbers. So the WASD is considered the gold standard. It's the, um, it's the official US custom government estimates that influence commodity prices. Um, and other players are always seeing if they could um, best us, if you will, or, or they're just, you know, wanting to be a part of the process. And so, um, you know, you could ask other institutions if they think our numbers are the best, um, but we've seen a lot of evidence that uh, no one is necessarily uh, refuting our numbers, that we're just all doing our best to see who who has the 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 best numbers. The other thing that I have to say is that we do this on a monthly basis, right? So we have a system to how we're doing it, but crops are not harvested um, necessarily every single month. And as you get closer to harvest and um, the official report reports of the harvest data comes in, that's when crop estimates are the best. So our numbers might be a little off earlier in a crop season, um, but we're making those monthly adjustments as you get closer and closer to harvest, that's when they become more official or more reliable. Um, and so we consider our, our current year estimates to be just that, to be forecasted estimates. Um, and then you get two years later, and that's when they become the, like the official final number. And so we're always in this process. Um, and for us, you know, there's Southern Hemisphere that's at a very different um, seasonality than Northern Hemisphere. It gets, it gets a little complicated to say exactly when um, any country crop commodity pair is that final number. Um, but we have a lot of documentation on, on how we view that, how we, um, how we define these things. And so um, that's a very long-winded story, story to answering your question. Uh, we do our best to be independent and unbiased in our estimations. You know, sometimes some countries um, have their political in interests in, uh, what they say their farmers are achieving. And so we have to consider that lens um, when pursuing our, our estimates ourselves for about each country. I'm gonna keep going. I really appreciate the questions. Um, and I also wanna mention that, you know, as I mentioned, we are an all sources shop and one source of our information is remotely sensed in geospatial data. Um, we use this information because it supports global food crop monitoring and commodity production forecasting. Uh, it augments information from international sources. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail next. Um, you know, so, so we're utilizing not just uh, official government statistics, uh, but we're, we're looking at remotely sensed data to kind of, to, to um, sometimes supplement missing government statistics because not all countries are reporting their information na um, on an annual basis. And sometimes uh, to have more near real time information if a disaster happens, um, then usually the national statistics are kind of slow to um, adjust their estimates in accordance to that 
that disaster event. And so we're making those near real time adjustments immediately um, through our monthly process. And we, uh, we rely on remotely sensed data to help us do this. Um, so our group is focused on uh, estimating area production and yield. And that data comes from international agencies like USDA and the food agricultural, um, food and agriculture, the FAO, um, the Food and Agricultural Organization. Um, we also get numbers from government statistics, as I've mentioned, and research institutions and private companies get involved in making these estimates as well. Um, so those data sources predominantly from your international agencies and your government statistical agencies, they come from agricultural censuses and surveys. And those, when, when a government pursues a census, what they're doing is sending a survey out to a farmer to have that farmer um, detail, you know, what crops they've grown and what they, believe their yield is gonna be and you know how many acres have they planted and all these kinds of data. Um, so they're, they're considered very reliable, strong data sets, um, but sometimes you know farmers are making the best estimates they can and, and could be off um, if it's um, when they're predicting, especially their yield in the future. Um, and then separately, the data can come from remote sensing. Uh, most countries rely predominantly on the census and survey data. Um, Canada has actually invested a lot in their satellite imagery and they're leveraging satellite imagery into their estimates um, more and more every year. It's quite fascinating work that they're doing. Um, uh, so we utilize both sources of information from government, from, you know, from the governments around the world, as well as our own remote sensing analysis. But the drawbacks with remote sensing is that you have clouds, inconsistent data, and sometimes there's data interpretation challenges as well. Um, and I'm going to highlight that very briefly in this next slide. Um, you know, generally speaking, we find remote sensing helps us with estimating yields and giving us a sense of production data. Uh, it's the area statistic that continues to be the most challenging for not only ourselves, but the agricultural remote sensing community as a whole. And in part, that's because we have um, different spatial resolutions from different satellites. We have different spectral resolutions and different temporal resolutions. And that temporal is how often does the satellite repeat and detect the exact same location. Um, and so on the slide, we see an example here of spatial resolution differences. With Landsat 8 on the far left, it's a medium spatial resolution sensor from the US government. Um, you can see that the image looks a little blurry. And as you look towards the, the right, um, we get to that far right image with the highest detailed satellite imagery sensor. It shows you very cleanly the individual fields of, of different, um, you know, since many of those fields are very small, you can see the field boundaries of different fields more clearly there. Um, I'm, I'm very briefly touching on this because uh, in our training, we can go into more details to understand this uh, in more detail. But uh, here, I want to just simply highlight that both imagery and agricultural fields come in different sizes. We have small fields that require more remotely sensed data than larger fields. When there's a complex agricultural landscape with multiple crop seasons and intercropping, that also requires more remotely sensed data to understand what's going, what's growing where. And because of these complexities, in season crop type mapping is interesting to learn. It's often changing, and therefore it can be challenging to routinely produce. Um, but one thing that helps us. Uh, you know, do a better job at 
calculating area and identifying um, in season crop type mapping is ground truth data. Um, there's a variety of definitions of ground truth data, and normally I wouldn't use a, a Wikipedia source, but I wanted to capture this, um, this definition because I felt like it was the most simple. Um, and I really believe it relates more directly to the types of work that we'll be doing together. Um, so ground truth data is information that is known to be real or true provided by direct observation and measurement. And that's the um, important aspect of this definition to, to focus on. So we'll be going out into the field, directly observing what crop is grown in, um, in a plot, and then capturing our observation with a photo. Like this example, it's a photo of sorghum out of Kenya. Um, and we'll have our um, locational information captured with it to show exactly where that field is. Um, if we get through the training uh, effectively, then I would imagine we'll all be taking some great ground truth data, uh, like these photos here. Um, and some of them might be close-up shots of either the grain or the oil seed, or even the cro cotton crop that you can see in the middle photo. Um, and so these are just examples of some photos that we hope that you'll be aspiring towards collecting as well. Um, and so I've moved from the big picture of this, of what FAS does in the sense of market intelligence information. Hello. <laughs> and I want to just highlight um, on a few more slides, apologies if I'm taking long to tell this story, um, but with just a few more slides, I want to highlight more specifically what we're doing in our pilot project. So our objective is the creation of tr trustworthy crowdsourced ground truth data for mapping crops. And we're going to achieve this objective through three key goals. The first one is to build capacity among the youth to collect and manage agricultural data. The second one is to develop an approach with youth mappers to collect crowdsource scalable, standardized, and geographically distributed ground truth data on crops. And the third one is to connect youth with professionals in geospatial analysis and agriculture to support their career development. And many of you attended a session last week that is um, a session last week, uh, one of the remote sessions where uh, my colleague, Somya, she facilitated conversations with some professionals working in this arena. And they shared some useful information about Tanzanian agriculture, as well as some youth mapper projects happening around um, the continent of Africa. And so I hope you heard those, those talks. We'll have more of them in Arusha for those of you who are joining us there. Um, when it comes to identifying the crops, we want to prioritize data collection on maize, rice, cotton, peanut, and sorghum crops um, for this specific project. And then 30%, roughly 30% of our data collection will also cover other crops uh, wetlands, large stands of trees, and other unique identifiable features in the landscape, in part because these other items from the landscape um, can be confusers that um, make it difficult for us to understand um, which crops are, are the maize, rice, cotton, peanut, or sorghum crops. So um, this is all for us to leverage some ground truth data that could then be used uh, to come up with land cover maps. And this image here, it's a little messy, so I apologize if it's not super clear, um, but the areas in brown are croplands in Northern Tanzania. Um, and so this is an example of a land cover map that was created um, by 
the European Space Agency who provided Sentinel-2 imagery to, to produce this product. And so at the scale of this map, we can see that generally that we have an idea of where there are croplands in our target areas of Arusha, Mwanza, and Dodoma. Um, but the effort of this pilot project is to then go into greater detail and figure out what specific crops are grown in the fields in these areas. The field work, as I mentioned, will be in those three um, regions of Tanzania and youth mappers will split up into smaller groups to travel outside of the city and explore some farmland, which I think is fun and interesting work to do. Um, just add a, as a brief introduction, we'll need smartphones, a, a Kobo survey. Um, if you have a backup battery for your, your cell phone, that would be useful. Um, we'll have some field maps and paper surveys with us to use as a backup. Uh, you know, we all need to know like where we're going, what route we're taking, and uh, you might want to have a hat, some sunscreen, and a selfie stick with you when you're going out in the field so that you can take pictures from different angles, uh, which would be great. Um, the other thing we have to do before we go out into the field is make sure we're prepared. Um, checking on the data storage capacity of our cell phones, that we have locational services settings on, and those kinds of things. So this is just a brief introduction. We'll talk about all of these different needs in greater detail um, before we go out into the field together. So just keep these in mind. And once the data is collected, I want to give you just a couple ideas of how that data gets used or could get used. So these are examples from my team at the Foreign Agricultural Service. Um, other groups might utilize the data differently, but you can see in this map in Panama that um, there's an orange route that was taken. So they, they drove along this route to get to the agricultural areas and then collect the ground truth data um, as they were traveling through these, these fields. Um, for another example, you can see in the map on, on the right, um, the crop travel route that was taken. Those are basically the fields that were visited in this part of India. And this is one example of a photo that was taken that helped us understand that indeed the cotton crop um, is, is doing well and has not been, um, this specific field has not been poorly affected uh, by some pest uh, outbreak that they were reporting in the area. So we got a sense of, of the number of fields that were affected by the pests and, and not affected by the pests. Um, in summary, I want to mention that there's a lot of activities going on in this project, um, from OpenStreetMap to doing the remote mapping of landscape features. We're going to engage in the community to do some in-country participation, participatory GIS. Um, we want to broaden our, our knowledge about agriculture through professional development engage in some field work by doing that roadside crop identification surveys. Um, we'll be collecting all of this data in a database. So we'll be talking about the open source data repository that we're using. And then finally, because that database is open source, um, imagery analysis can happen, leveraging your ground truth data for machine learning purposes with satellite imagery. So that's the full picture of the project. Um, and the idea is that together, these activities build a bridge between youth and research teams to improve crop condition analysis and crop mapping with remotely sensed data. Um, I, I know that I've been talking a little too long, so um, if Stella is going to be sharing slides later, uh, I've highlighted a few of our key websites where you can get more information about a variety of these resources that I've mentioned today. And then um, I also want to thank the key organizers that are working on this team. Um, I'm working with USAID's GeoCenter, with Rory and Christine that you'll hear from very soon. Um, last week, 
my colleague Somya Banwari was involved in the professional development activities, and Luke Nye has joined us today. If um, I really appreciate their support and involvement. We have some great Youth Mapper organizers, especially, especially Stella leading us, um, and so and in a great team in Tanzania with the OMDTZ group working with us. So um, it's an amazing team and we're all contributing to this project. So I wanna thank you for your time. And um, I understand that Christine's gonna be talking with us next. Is that correct? That's right. Yes. And there's questions, but maybe you can answer there's them questions. with that. Um, yeah. There's plenty <laughs> of them, <laughs> which is awesome. Like it's great. Uh, but we're not, I think we're just going to keep moving. Is that right, Stella? Yes. Uh, answer them in the we, chat? Okay, great. Yeah. Touch some of those questions at the end. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, can you see this, Stella? Yes. Okay. Okay, so like Lisa just mentioned, we are going to be um, collecting ground truth data and two important pieces of information we need for this ground truth data is what crop is growing in a field and where that field is. So like in this example, we have a youth mapper standing on a roadside with their cell phone and they first record that they see maize in the field in front of them. And then they use the GPS on their phone to record where that field is. So to collect this uh, data efficiently and accurately on our phones, we will be using a tool called Kobo Toolbox. And I'll just call it um, Kobo from now on. So this is just meant to be a really quick intro to that tool. Okay, so Kobo is a free toolkit to collect and manage data. And there's three components or of Kobo or three steps you take to create a project like our crop mapping project. So first you um, create a data collection form with their online tool, which is pretty easy to do from a technical standpoint. You just go on their website and enter questions and possible answers. Uh, so for this crop project, we have already created the form for youth mappers. And then second, you um, load the form onto your cell phone and collect the data and then submit uh, the data to a server once you have internet access. And uh, third, if you are part of the project creation team, you go back on their website and you can review all the data that was submitted. You can clean it and then export it. So this picture on the right is just a mock-up map of round truth points, like the points we'll be collecting in, um, in Tanzania. So why would we use a data collection tool like Kobo? Uh, first, there's no paper forms to lose or to get wet uh, or to transcribe, which means um, typing, in, typing out everything that was written down on a form, which introduces a lot of human error. It's free to use, and there's free server space too, which is great because you don't have to set up a server and you don't have to pay for it uh, as long as we keep within a certain limit. It's easy to set up. Um, it works offline, which is great when you don't have internet access or a cell phone signal. It collects spatial data with your phone's GPS and automatically associates that data with all the other information you're collecting or even pictures you're taking in the field. And it's widely used by humanitarian organizations. So that means that it's well-tested it is regularly updated, and there is an active forum for technical support. Um, Youth Mappers has been using Kobo, and I know that actually a lot of you on the Kahoot said you use Kobo, which is great. I just have two examples uh, for how Youth Mappers have been using this tool. So first, in Uganda, 
um, students map uh, flood infrastructure. So they recorded the location of drainages and if those drainages were clogged or not, because clogged drainages would result in water backing up and flooding communities. So the result of their data collection efforts are on the right, where the drainage points are colored by the different statuses of whether they were clogged or not. And then as a second example, in Malawi, youth mappers use Kobo to map the location of bike repair shops and bike routes and recorded the condition of these routes. So this is the result of some of their data collection efforts um, in Zamba. And it shows the bike repair shops and it shows the routes and the idea is that this data could be used to improve road safety and access to bike services. So I wanted you guys to try out a data collection form that I created. Um, if you could go to this URL, it will bring you to a Kobo form either on your cell phone or your laptop, um, tinyurl.com slash Kobo 44. And uh, if you can access, access this, that's great. If you can't, uh, that's okay. We'll be doing this for a few minutes and I'll be walking through the form as well on this presentation. So if you can't access the form, you can just follow along. But I'm gonna give you guys um, 30 seconds to get to uh, this tinyurl.com slash Kobo 44, or you can follow the QR code if you have a cell phone with internet access. Okay, so while people are getting connected, um, the URL is still on the top of this page. The first screen you should see is this, well, you only see one screen and it starts with example form, how would you use Cobell? And there's three questions, so it's a really quick form. The first question is, if you could collect data anywhere with your Youth Mappers chapter, anywhere in the world, where would you go? So if you are on a computer, you should see a map right away. If you are on your phone, um, you might, at least on my phone, I only see a white box with the word map inside. So if you click that button that says map, a map should appear on your uh, phone. And then I can tell you guys how to interact with that map. So I'm gonna assume that whoever is in, wants to be in the form is in the form. Click on the map button if you're on your phone or if you don't see the, um, the map on your computer. Okay, so to click a point on the map or to select a point on the map, the first thing you're gonna have to do is zoom in to any place. So this acts just like any other, um, probably any other mapping um, app on your phone where you would have to pinch and drag the map with your fingers by holding down. If you're on the computer, you can use this um, plus or minus to zoom in and out and then hold down your mouse and drag it to get to a certain place. So you're going to drag your, um, map to a place you want to, uh, to research, to collect data about. And then you're going to uh, touch the map if you're on the phone or click the map if you're on, the, on your computer to add a, a single point. And it doesn't have to be accurate. This is just a little exercise. So choose a place and then if you are on your phone to get back to the form, click the arrow button on the top left to return to the question form. You might also see that it says search for place or address. 
that functionality is not working for me. So the best way to get to a place you're thinking of is to zoom in and then, oh, and drag the map with your finger or with your mouse, and then um, just add a point manually. Okay, and then I'm just making sure that, thank you for sharing that link, Janet. Okay. And then there's two more questions. The second question is what topic would you collect data for? And I'm just using this form to kind of give you an idea that there's multiple question types. We just use the location question type, specifically a point. You can also collect lines like the bike routes. You can collect polygons. Another question type is a multiple choice question where you give possible answers, which allows for more um, standardized answers, which is great when you're needing to have clean data. So what topic would you collect data for? Agriculture and food security, conservation and the environment, disaster prevention or response, education, health, or other. And then the last question type is numerical. And it's approximately how many days would it take your chapter to collect the data? What's nice about this question, it only allows you to enter numbers. If you start typing letters, well, it won't let you. So it limits the response and that helps um, reduce uh, cleaning afterwards. So after you've entered your answers, you're going to click the submit button on the bottom. And I'm going to show you what the answers look like, hopefully, <laughs> um, here. So if you go to, you can't do this, but if you were designing your project and wanted to see what the data was looking like that was coming in from people, you can go to the data page on Kobo Toolbox and you'll see a table. Let me see, refresh and see if people have added data. Oh yeah, awesome. Okay, so every question has a column and every row is a different response from a different person. And then um, if we go to reports, we can see answers and I'll just refresh it one more time in case more people have. Okay, so very nice. Most people would uh, collect data on um, ag and food security and they think on average, they would spend about 10 days collecting data. And then you can also look at a map of the points people dropped. And it looks like somebody wants to work in China. Somebody wants to work in Malawi. Most people want to work in Tanzania, maybe in different communities you live in. Okay, so that's just to give you an example of uh, what a form looks like and what the output looks like. If you wanted to create your own um, data collection pro uh, project, you would start with creating this question form, like the question form you just answered. So here's what you would need to do. You would go to this website and importantly, go to the URL that says sanitary in it, and that allows you access to um, UN's humanity response server. You would click create an account. And then on the next page, don't go, you don't have to do this right now. It's going to take some time. So I would encourage you to do this afterwards if you don't have a Kobo um, account. On the next page, you'll fill in your name, your email address, and create a username. And for education, uh, for service uh, sector, you're going to select educational services. Brent McCusker has a really good um, short tutorial about what to do from there, how to create a form. So we'll share these slides with you later so you can have this URL and get that um, in depth lesson. Okay, so just two considerations before you use Kobo. So first, of course, it requires a smartphone um, and a smartphone that has uh, at least some storage capacity. So that could be a barrier to entry depending on who is collecting data with you. 
And then secondly, no matter how you collect data, no matter if it's Kobo or even just pen and paper, you have to be thoughtful about the data you collect and think about what would cause an inadvertent risk, especially information. Are you collecting personable, personally identifiable, identifiable information like names or street addresses? And if so, how will you protect that information? Is there any risk in collecting GPS locations? If so, how are you going to protect that information? Could you gather other data that is going to be just as helpful? So things to think about, and we can definitely talk about that in the in-person training. Lastly, last slide, just some best practices for collecting data. So once you're outside, you're ready to go, um, things to think about. So first, charge your smartphone. I think we're all going to say this, but you need as much battery as possible because you're going to be taking pictures, you're going to be using GPS, and you're probably going to have the screen as bright as possible because it's outside. Um, you need internet to load the form. Ideally, there's a ways to get around this, but easiest to have internet to load the form. So do that before you go outside or to a remote area. Once the form is on your phone, you can um, collect the data offline. If your location accuracy is poor, turn off airplane mode and battery saver mode, move away from buildings and trees. Um, once you get back inside with internet access, make sure your data is uploaded before your phone does anything funky with clearing the cache and you lose all your data. And then lastly, lastly um, practice using your form before actually collecting data. So there could be issues with, oh, I should have asked this question or I should have asked it in a different order. I should add answers and you'll only be able to figure those things out or you should be able to figure those things out before you deploy a lot of people with your app in different places to collect these data. But I am going to stop there. I'll answer questions in the chat and I'm gonna turn it over to Rory now. Thank you so much, Kristen. Um, before Rory takes over, um, I think we would take like a three minute breather ah, for okay. people to just take in um, this information. Um, it's been a lot. Um, and I'm hoping that um, everybody is really curiously um, listening um, and preparing all those questions. Please bring them on. Um, most of them are being answered in the chat. So keep posting them. Um, also, um, on an interesting note is that um, some of our chapters really did have um, like pre-engagement events before these, um, and some of them are uh, present, but in larger groups than usual. Um, University of Dodoma chapter um, and IRDP Mwanza. Um, and um, it's of interest that um, the chapter advisor for University of Dodoma is present. Um, and um, Mr. Magige, if you would like to say a word um, on behalf of your team and perhaps the inspiration for that pre-engagement event. Mr. Magige. Hello. Hi. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Um, please uh, say hello to the team and um, introduce your chapter and um, probably tell us about the motivation uh, for the pre-engagement that you, your team had, your chapter had. We've received okay. amazing pictures, yeah. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, we are UDOM or University of Dodoma chapter. We have been having a meeting before this one. So some of us have remained here and joined this meeting from here where we are. We are in the class and we are very glad to join you there. And we are at least now catching up after having a pre-meeting before this one. So we have 
been telling or teaching ourselves some of the issues relating to first of all use mappers in general osm and everything else and then we go to the crop ground truthing project we have explained the details of the of the of the project and then we are glad today we are at least getting some insights on how we are going to conduct the the the, the ground truthing itself so we are very pleased to join this meeting. Um, Baraka Jungwa, the advisor for the chapter. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Baraka. Okay. Um, yeah, um, I guess um, afterwards we'll have IRDP for now. I think that's enough of the break. Um, Rory, over to you. Cool. Thank you so much. And amazing to see uh, a class full of, of students participating in this uh, virtual training session. Thank you guys so much for, for organizing that type of event. I'm going to share my screen and start my slideshow. And hopefully everyone can see. But first of all, thank you so much uh, for um, the introduction to the project that Lisa did earlier and the details about um, how um, this ground truth data connects to her work on remote sensing. And thank you, Christine, for talking about Kobo Toolbox, the tool um, that we will be using in the field to um, ground truth that data, the actual technical tool to do that. I'll be talking um, about a different aspect of the project um, a little uh, different from the previous two um, um, topics, and that will be participatory mapping and community engagement. Um, and so um, why are we learning about this? Well, first, I want folks here to understand the concepts of participatory mapping and community engagement, um, how it will be applied to this project, why is it essential for the project, um, and be prepared to learn more about these topics at the training in Arusha, or when the students youth mappers come back from Arusha um, to the different chapters in Tanzania, they can you'll be prepared to learn um, and be ready to go with some more advanced topics um, after that and conduct the surveys in your own um, communities. And of course, we want to I want to prepare you to ask uh, Brent McCusker, Professor Brent McCusker, some very tough questions on PGIS uh, uh, when we're in Tanzania ourselves. Okay, so let's start off by um, looking at what is participatory mapping. Um, and below you can see a hand-drawn map done by a community member. And I am just gonna uh, read uh, this definition for you and then kind of explain what it means to me. Um, I know that's not typical for a presentation, but I think it's important here because it's an important topic. So particip participatory mapping is a map-making process that attempts to make visible the association between land and local communities by using the commonly understood and recognized language of cartography. As with any type of map, participatory maps present spatial information at various scales. And this is the definition used by the International Fund for Agricultural Development. And so, uh, first of all, um, it's important to note that this is a, um, a method that's used in uh, agricultural development. Um, and so it's an important um, uh, concept and uh, aspect of this project. Um, so when the definition says it's a process, I think that's a very important part to point out. Um, it is um, not just the end result of the map that we're interested in um, creating, but it's the process of engaging the community to create that map that is really important. Um, and it's that, process is how we make that connection between communities and the spatial data we are col uh, collecting. Um, and cartography is the tool we're using to make that happen. And um, we can design this project uh, participatory mapping to happen in a lot of different ways, um, but I'll be going over how we should be doing it um, for this project soon. Um, but why are we doing this in the first place? Um, so traditional GIS, you know, everything that we're learning as geographers to do, um, can reinforce kind of top-down planning. Um, and so if you look at the picture on the right, I live in a city called Baltimore, Maryland. And one of my favorite things to do is biking. 
so, you know, if I was in charge, I would put bike lanes everywhere and have it be done my way. But that not that might not be what the community wants in certain neighborhoods. They probably want, you know, bigger roads or more parks or places to park their cars or whatever it is, maybe golf courses, who knows? Um, and so um, top-down GIS is kind of a limited point of view through um, a certain people doing analysis. Um, it's also kind of expensive to do uh, GIS analysis and requires a lot of technical expertise. Um, you know, you need to procure software and computers. Uh, you need to be have a trained professional to do it. And so it can be very limiting to the amount of people who are able to access this type of specialized knowledge. And so PGIS um, uses, instead of this you know, fancy advanced technology, which is also very important, don't get me wrong, um, but it kind of delivers this uh, uh, project in a way that is uh, relevant to the communities who will be affected by this type of, of work. Um, and it also helps provide a wide range of perspectives uh, of what's important features to, to map. As geographers, when we're making a map, as cartographers, we have to make a lot of different decisions along the way. What colors to use, what features to leave on the map, what features to leave off the map, where to put labels, how to style those labels, what colors to use. And every time we make one of those decisions, uh, we have the potential uh, to introduce a little bit of our own personal biases. And so by engaging a larger group, uh, we help minimize those impacts and represent what the community wants instead of what uh, you know, a single individual or organization wants. Um, so what are the basic steps uh, for uh, this type of work? Um, first is research design. Um, that's where you initiate the study, uh, get the focus of what the type of data you wanna collect uh, from there, um, and you identify the participants, uh, any ethical considerations that need to be done, and a validation or verification process to um, confirm that that data is actually accurate. Um, then you actually engage in the next step, which is the data gathering process. Um, and that's where you conduct the study, the PGS uh, event, um, where you capture stakeholders' insights, experiences, and perspectives, things that are kind of harder to see in just pure geographic data on its own. The next step after that is to analyze that data um, to kind of collect it and maybe put it into a tabular format or a geospatial format um, and analyze the data and, and review it and think critically about it. Um, another important step is to create materials like maps, perhaps, or reports to share those results back to the community members who participated in the uh, event, but also to decision makers um, who you're um, helping um, um, translate this, the local community's information to, like their, their opinions. And then uh, the last step is hopefully leverage all of this uh, good work into um, action. So some type of solutions uh, and um, work that you'll do based off of this information. Okay, I know this is a lot of text and I'm not gonna read every single piece of it. Um, I actually had four more slides full of text for best practices for here. <laughs> There's a lot of, uh, of, of, of things to consider while you're working on a PGIS uh, project. Um, but some important ones I wanna highlight um, is to be open and honest, always be a very good communicator when you're doing a PGIS project. What is the purpose of the project? Uh, where is the data going to be going, how is the data going to be used, and to be very transparent. We need to get consent from community members, uh, making sure that they understand that this data will be used and how their privacy uh, will be protected. Um, and then it's also important to recognize that you're working with a lot of different communities um, and our presence uh, in this kind of discussion, this kind of PGS activity is not politically neutral meaning that we will influence what they say. They might think, uh, you know, because there's someone from USAID here or from USDA, that they might not share all the information um, that um, they would share otherwise. I remember when I was doing a PGIS activity in Malawi with Brent, uh, we were uh, going to different markets and asking for the price of, of spare parts for bicycle um, um, equipment. 
And the price when I asked was a lot more expensive than when a youth mapper from Malawi asked the price. And so that just proved to me that uh, our presence um, will influence uh, what information the communities are willing to share. And so you have to um, keep that in um, the back of your mind. Um, you know, we're engaging community members who have to be very considerate of their time. Um, but at the same time, we don't want to uh, rush anything. And we want to make sure that uh, they trust us in this process and that we'll be good stewards of their information that they share. Um, we also have to be very flexible um, in responding to uh, how the community wants to share information or what information they want to share, because um, they are really in charge in this process and leading it, not us. We're here to help facilitate and help extract some of that data, um, but we're not leading it at all. Other best practices are to, uh, you know, use uh, technology that can be understood by local people or local technology intermediaries. Um, I think uh, the youth mappers in these projects will be considered uh, technology intermediaries and to make sure you have sufficient training. Um, so that's why we're doing this now, having these remote sessions, and that's why we'll be having a workshop in Arusha. Um, and this is also why I always encourage my colleagues when we do things like this to use maybe uh, technology that's being widely used in, uh, uh, in the country. Um, we've seen that there's been previous work done with COBOL Toolbox, um, and that's why we're, we've selected that tool, or it's one of the reasons why we selected to use that tool, because it's already being used and it's uh, low cost to use in Tanzania. Um, and then uh, the last bullet here is to ensure the outputs of the mapping process are understood by all those concerned. Um, that includes the community members, the different stakeholders, the technology intermediaries, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that just means, you know, not just forgetting about people at the end of the project and taking the data and using it for our own reports, but to share it back with everyone. Um, one other thing um, I think isn't discussed nearly enough in Youth Mappers projects is uh, an ethical code of conduct. Um, I've listed three different examples here from different uh, organizations, including Youth Mappers um, and the uh, GS Certification Institute and a uh, urban planning um, and uh, organization based in the US um, um, that all have really good um, um, codes of ethics um, that I suggest you review. These are links and you can click on them when we uh, share the slides out. Cool. So let's talk a little bit more about uh, PGIS in the context of this activity that we'll, we will be doing in uh, Arusha and in Tanzania. Um, and here's a photo from USAID of a project where they um, worked with farmers to grow different varieties of Irish potatoes to increase uh, their yields. Um, so here's a basic outline, and we'll go way more into depth uh, once we're in uh, Tanzania. But um, the first step in a good PGIS is to prepare the data. Um, and so if you're in the youth mapper situation, we love OpenStreetMap, and I personally love OpenStreetMap. And so um, the first step for me always is to um, uh, look at OpenStreetMap and uh, clean up the data for the target area where we're engaging a community. Um, or create more data in that community if it's under mapped. Um, once that is done, we will create maps of these communities and the surrounding agricultural area uh, and print them out to be used in um, our PGIS activity. Um, we like to print these maps out as big as we can, A0 on a big plotter, um, to make sure that uh, multiple community members and youth mappers can um, um, stand around these maps and uh, point out features on them and write on them and uh, add more data to it and things like that. So once we are in country and we have the actual uh, community meeting, um, we'll conduct the PGS, PGIS activity and it will follow these basic six steps. Um, you know, the first step uh, based on the best practices is to meet with the community members to introduce the project and for them to ask questions and basically give us their consent for us to work with them on this project, that they're willing to share their information um, and that they clearly understand what we will be doing with that data. 
Um, once that is done and we've answered all the questions, we'll break off into small groups to conduct the community asset mapping portion of the prod of the PGIS activity. So this is where youth mappers and community members will be together. Uh, youth mappers, because we want you guys to be speaking the local languages, Swahili and things like that. And um, the first step is to create these travel maps, or I actually call them mobility maps um, later in the presentation. Um, and we will be doing an activity together if we have time uh, on, uh, to do one of those as an example today. Um, and then we ask community members to add the features that they've created in these mobility maps uh, to the large community maps I just talked about um, by actually physically drawing them on. And then uh, youth mappers will help facilitate and encourage discussion on the features that are being added to the map and fill in any important uh, features that are missing um, or take off any features that are inappropriate, for example. So that is the community mapping portion. And then hopefully we'll have farmers in the room and we'd like to get extra data and information from the farmers about their fields and about the crops that they're growing this year. So this is where we uh, take different maps out um, that are focused on uh, the agricultural uh, areas of the, of the community. And we ask farmers to locate their fields, to draw the field boundaries and tell us what type of crops are growing there. We then ask other questions to get uh, to inform the analysis later, um, such as, you know, what type of irrigation are they using? Is it rain fed? Is it, you know, um, drip irrigation? Um, have they faced any problems this year? Um, you know, have there been agricultural pests? Has there been other diseases? Has drought affected the quality of their of their harvest? Things like that. And then we will use this information later to um, add a more detail and understanding to our Kobo toolbox field work that we do when we walk around the fields or in the, in the countryside looking at the fields from the roads later on in the project. Cool. So I talked about a little bit about mobility maps. Um, and this is where I hope everyone has a, a paper and pen because uh, we're actually going to create one in a second from your perspective as youth members. So uh, mobility, mobility maps help us understand what locations and features are important for the community members we're talking to. Uh, and the destinations between um, the different men and women in the room or for people with different livelihoods or different age groups will be very different. So it's important to always make sure we have a very representative group from the community uh, in these discussions. So to do a mobility map, we start by asking them the top five locations that they travel to in a given month. Um, try not to lead the community members too much with this activity. Don't uh, lead them on, tell them like what locations you should be going to. Let them organically come up with this idea themselves. This might take a little bit of time for them to think about, um, but just encourage them to think hard about the five most pl frequent places that they visit or the five most important places that they visit. Once we have those five locations, we and you'll see this in a picture in the next slide, uh, we take those five locations and with the community member uh, located with their name at the center of the map, they draw the five locations they most frequently visit and we connect these locations with an arrow. So the length of the arrow is how far the, uh, the, the important location is from where they live. Uh, and so the longer the arrow, the further away the location is, the shorter the arrow, the closer the location is. And then the width of the arrow uh, is the frequency they travel to that location. So the wider the arrow, the more frequently they travel to that place in a month, and the more narrow the arrow, arrow the, uh, the less amount they travel to that location in a given month. Ooh, Ooh. a little slow. So here's basically what it'll look like. You'll have the community member in the middle and you'll have these four locations in around the piece of paper. And then these arrows to the right, uh, you can see that they're different widths and lengths will be connected to these locations um, um, based off of what I just described. So here's an example for me. Uh, I'll just take you through this really quick. Um, so one of the most frequent places I travel to is a place called Sophomore Coffee, 
Um, I like to drink fancy coffee in the morning. Uh, I need it to wake up. Otherwise, I am very tired and slow and will fall asleep on my computer. And uh, sophomore has very good coffee and it's pretty close to my uh, house. So I go there way too much because it's so easy. And they even have uh, some very good coffee from Tanzania there. Another place I go to a lot is Trinacria, which is an Italian restaurant that makes very delicious pizza. I think you heard a little bit about pizza already in these different presentations. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about pizza from me because it's my favorite food in the whole world. Um, and so I go there a lot when I'm feeling lazy um, to cook, too lazy to cook at home. Um, and then you can see on the left hand side, uh, the office. I only go into the uh, physical office uh, for USAID once a week. Uh, and it's pretty far because it's in Washington, D.C. Um, so that's why you see a very narrow line because I only go uh, you know, once a week or four times a month. Sometimes it's only three times a month. Um, and it's a long arrow because it takes a long time for me to travel there. Next, uh, in the bottom left, you see the Washington Monument, um, which is a, uh, a meeting point for uh, people in Baltimore to go on bike rides. We go on different bike rides a few times a week, um, about two times a week. So you can see that it's thicker than the, the office, um, but uh, much closer the, the arrow than the office um, because it's about a 10 minute bike ride from my house. And then the last place is a bar <laughs> called Idle Hour. Um, so sometimes I like to have a couple drinks um, and, uh, you know, it's not very frequently I go to this place because it's a little bit expensive. Um, so that's why you see a very narrow line um, and it's in the south part of my city. Um, so it's very easy to get to, but a lot harder to get back. So I don't go that much. Oop. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, that's my mobility map um, I created as an example. So now hopefully everyone has a paper and pen or pencil they can use. And uh, I'd like you all to create your own mobility map. Um, so if we can take maybe five minutes to do that and uh, some of us can share, uh, I might call on some people to do that. Um, so hopefully everyone understands and I can't see the questions. Um, so Stella, Christine or Lisa, please let me know if there's any questions about this activity, um, I can. No questions so far about this activity, Lori. Okay. Great, thank you. Christine, I might call on you too. So uh, Christine. Oh, Prince, shoot, I heard uh, you guys. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you want as well. So I'm gonna start working on mine and then I'll share mine and then I'll hopefully have some volunteers to share their mobility maps in a second. So yeah, four more minutes.
Okay, I hope people are doing well. Um, Rory, there is, um, I think, a question in the chat. Uh, probably you can answer that um, after uh, people have shared examples of their mobility maps. Janet is us, um, saying that she's a bit unclear how mobility maps will help ground truth crop data. Yep, uh, good question. And I think once we talk about um, the, how we use this data in the next couple of slides, uh, hopefully that becomes a little bit more clear. Okay, I'm gonna give it one more minute. Okay, I'm going to share mine first, and then uh, hopefully someone else will volunteer. If not, I might try to call on someone. So I'm going to start my video and hold mine up. Oh, no, I need to turn off the blurring. One second. Um, cool. Um, so here's the one I created. It's pretty similar to the one you saw on the slide. Can you um, stop sharing your screen or something? I don't know, just so it's easier for everybody to see your video. There we go. Okay. Yeah, cool. now we see you. Yeah. Um, awesome. So, yep, here's my mobility map. Um, I created, uh, you can see I'm not the best artist, um, so my arrows probably aren't that great. Um, but I have the five places uh, I most frequent in the month. Starting with the largest, you can see is the supermarket. Um, I like to cook and uh, I always forget ingredients. So I always have to go back and get more ingredients from the supermarket. So that's probably one of the most frequent places I visit um, in a uh, given month. Um, as I've mentioned earlier, the next largest is probably um a pizza restaurant because i love pizza so much uh and when i'm lazy from cooking that's where i go office uh, another frequent place i travel you can see how long it is that arrow because it's in a different city um is uh, another place i travel to and then um my brother's house is next uh he lives in the same city as me and i like to go visit and play with his pet dog and then bike shop i go to to buy to, um, uh, tubes or tires for my bike when it I get flats and stuff like that or new chains and things like that because I bike so much. So that's just a pretty simple example of the five most frequent places I visit in a given month. Any other person would like to share any mobility map that they created? It'll be very interesting to have um, at least one of the students share their mobility map. Christine, were you able to make one by any chance or Brent or Stella even? Yeah, I do have one if you want to see Ooh, it. Oh, yeah, do Brent. So I need, I need screen sharing, please.
you should be ready to share, Dr. Makoska. Okay, I did mine on a an app called Freeform, so I'm just trying to find it. Uh, let's see if that's it. Oh, that's not it. Sorry. Maybe I can. Oh, I know what I can do. I can just go to screen. And it should be here. Yep, there we go. Can you see my screen? Yep. Great. Yes. So that's much like Rory's with the home in the middle. And um, unfortunately, those are the five places I go to the most. Not very exciting. I drew a little hash lines because the record shop that I really like is super far away. It's a next city away. So I couldn't make my map to scale because I hadn't thought of that when I did that. So I go to the airport, I go to the gym, I go to the store, and I go to work a lot and you can see those, those lines. So that's my, that's my uh, mobility map. I'll stop sharing. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that, Brent. And uh, I know it's a, a big ask to put the students on the spot. And, you know, with the uh, Zoom technology, we have to grant uh, co-host permission. So maybe instead, uh, you can send a picture uh, to the WhatsApp group um, that we've created for this project um, when you've created yours on your own. Okay, uh, so hopefully I'll answer some of the questions. I'm going to go pretty quick because we only have 10 minutes left. I'm going to share my screen again. Um, cool. Um, hopefully that's uh, everyone can see. Um, so the next step after doing mobility maps um, is the community oh, 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 community asset mapping. Um, here's a picture uh, from one of the activities we did in uh, Zomba, Malawi. Um, you can see a bunch of women gathered around a map that we made from uh, that Brent made from uh, uh, OpenStreetMap, and there you can see one of the uh, uh, members has a pen that they're using to to draw data onto the map. Um, why? Cool. Um, just wanted to share two more pictures from the same event. Um, you can see on the left uh, me <laughs> in a with my backwards hat on, uh, and uh, youth mapper students and community members um, looking at a hand drawn map that they did of their community map where they drew important features to them. And then on the right is another map created from OpenStreetMap data, where you can see some data has been added uh, um, to the map itself. Man, sorry, my computer is very slow. Um, so what is community asset mapping? Um, it's where we collect uh, community members' insights by discussing and drawing on a map. Um, it includes a formal map as the base, um, can also be a hand-drawn map that community members create on their own. Um, in the previous pictures, you saw um, that we used OpenStreetMap data to create that more formal map. Um, yeah. Um, and so we don't really use GPS to create this map. Um, it's more um, our common knowledge to, to uh, geolocate ourselves using features like rivers, markets, and churches, and, thing, and anything like that. Um, and so uh, when we engage the community around these different maps, this is where uh, we ask them specific questions about um, different aspects of the map. But this is also where the mobility map comes into play. Um, so we're less interested in the, um, the, the arrows uh, in this use case of, of the community mapping, um, but it's an activity to use to get community members to start thinking spatially, to start thinking about what assets in their community are important to them. Um, so we can put it on the map. Um, and then, so we would take what the, the locations that they put on their mobility map, and we would ask them to locate them on these bigger maps. Um, so they would ask them to, um, you know, find, okay, where is that pizza restaurant? Where is uh, the record store? Where is the office? Show us where it is. Let's label it on the map. And then we can take that map later and um, add that data into OpenStreetMap, for example. Um, yeah. 
Um, so, uh, like I said, as a youth mapper, you'll be helping facilitate the community asset mapping activity. Uh, your role is to help facilitate the discussion and support the community members to add those features that are important to them, including what's in the mobility map, uh, as well as uh, other features that might um, pop up when they start adding those things. Encourage discussion between community members to discuss like, oh, like, are you sure that church is over there? Maybe it's really over here. I thought it was on this side of the river, things like that. And then ask them what's missing. What else is important? You know, maybe they didn't think about adding uh, schools or health facilities or pizza places. Um, so help them kind of think about those places without telling them what to do or and without telling them uh, what is uh, important to add because we want to know from them what is really important. The other important thing to remember while we're facilitating these discussions is to take notes. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll have more than one youth mapper with each group of community members, and one will be helping facilitate the discussion, while the other will be the secretary taking notes uh, on the kind of what is being discussed, um, because this will inform our analysis later. Cool. And then um, we'll have a second portion to the uh, uh, PGIS activity, um, and that'll be farmer interviews uh, and discussions um, as well. So hopefully we'll be able to get community members uh, who, uh, who are actual farmers uh, in these meetings as well. Um, and so uh, here's a picture from a USAID activity where they're training uh, farmers in Tanzania best practices around growing different plants. Uh, I'm no expert, so Lisa, tell me if I'm wrong, but those look like tomatoes to me. Um, yeah. I think you got it. Cool. Okay. Um, so, um, like I said, if we're lucky, we'll have members of the communities who are farmers, and we want to take the opportunity to interview them and get more in-depth knowledge than we would be able to get just by looking at their fields uh, from the field mapping portion of the project. So the goals would be to understand uh, where uh, they are located um, by asking them to show us where their fields are uh, on the map. We can actually draw the boundaries on uh, on on, a, on the map if we like. Um, we would ask them what types of crops they are growing in those fields. You know, is this maize? Is this maize and sorghum? Things like that. Um, and then we would ask them questions about. Um, what types of challenges or issues they face this year? Um, I've heard from our from Lisa and other agricultural experts that there's a bit of a drought this year, or the rains that came have, have arrived late. Um, so understanding if that's impacted their uh, what they chose to plant, uh, how much they think they will get from this year's harvest, things like that. Um, this will give us a nice in-depth knowledge about these fields that we won't be able to get and be very complementary to um, the uh, field work we'll be doing. Um, and then uh, we also want to better understand uh, the market systems related to agriculture. Um, so not just mapping their fields, uh, but mapping other features such that are important to agriculture, such as markets and, and uh, grain mills. Um, when I was looking at the data for Arusha, uh, in OpenStreetMap, I noticed that OMDTZ, who are helping us out with this project, back in 2021, did a survey for the World Food Program to help locate uh, a lot of these features, uh, such as mills. So we'll make sure to have those on the map, and they can tell us, like, oh, no, this one has closed. This one doesn't exist anymore, um, and information like that. Um, and so it'll be really useful to help uh, understand uh, the broader uh, agricultural market systems that we are surveying as part of the ground truthing activity. Cool. After we've collected all this data, uh, it's really nice, but it's all on paper. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of us have been trained on more digital data, data analysis techniques. And so the next step is to transfer that uh, data to uh, 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 a, a way we can analyze um, some of it. Um, like I said earlier, we're all big fans of OpenStreetMap. So moving things there, like points of interest the community members have pointed out, um, attribute data, 
um, you know, names of roads, things like that will be very important. So this project just doesn't benefit our analysis, but helps uh, contribute back to the larger uh, um, humanitarian and development communities and, uh, and as well as the communities themselves, right? OpenStreetMap is free and accessible. So in theory, uh, folks will be able to um, download and access this data, change the data, things like that. Um, and if not them, um, these kind of technology intermediaries would be able to do that. And then finally, um, it's important to note that there's a lot of data that should not be included and probably shouldn't be collected at all in the first place. And that's, um, you know, farmers' names, community members' names, their addresses, phone numbers, crop conditions, things like that. That should not go on the map. Just the basic publicly accessible things like here's the clinic, here's the mill. Here's, uh, you know, the the market we take our stuff to, information like that, but not personal information. So I knew I, th I threw a lot at you guys. So thank you so much. I know it's, we've all thrown a lot at you, so it's a lot to digest, but we'll be sharing these presentations with you. There'll be nice links in there. And um, we really encourage you guys to take another look at this uh, 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 presentation so you can learn a little bit more uh, about this in your own time. And I look forward to seeing some of those mobility maps uh, in the WhatsApp group. Um, don't be shy. There's no wrong answers. It's about, you know, that we're collecting information about you um, and what you do. But also, if you don't feel comfortable sharing, there's no pressure to do that. And it shouldn't take a long time. And so this last picture is a uh, agricultural extension agent uh, someone whose job it is to be an agricultural expert in different communities, um, who's been supported by a USA program called Feed the Future. Um, and he's in Tanzania, and that looks like a uh, maze to me um, that he's standing in. And so uh, hopefully, maybe not by the end of this, this these remote trainings, but once we've had some practical experience, you'll be able to be kind of junior uh, ag ex extension agents as well as youth mappers. Cool. I'll end it there. Um, I know we're right at time. Um, I can try to answer some questions if there are some. Uh, but over to you, Stella. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Rory. Um, that was, um, I believe that at this moment, everyone is saturated. Um, but um, to round it up, um, this brings us to the end of our last session. Um, and I cannot um, go without saying thank you um, to our presenters, Rory, Lisa, and Christine. You've done such an amazing job to enrich the team with all the components of the project and the understanding of the agricultural um, phase um, or theme uh, within this project. Um, the introduction of USDA and all it does, I'm so sure that some of the youth mappers, this has been their first time to learn about USDA, and now they are really enriched, you know, with more knowledge. Um, and also being able to cover and round some of the components um, in our project um, that we need to be looking at as youth mappers. Um, so just to wrap it, um, for the three um, major sessions that we did have, uh, we now know that our project abstractly, um, um, in an abstract sense, engages remote mapping, um, which again, we've been touching on in each and every session. Um, and here, Aruri has even expounded more on why we have to do this remote mapping exercise. So um, amongst ourselves as the different chapter members and the students participating in this project, we should all be finding our niche. Um, if I am the advanced or great remote mapper, or I enjoy to do remote mapping, probably, um, you should already be taking interest on, you know, um, the next um, phase of the project. Um, field mapping, which will um, take place very soon. Um, I'm going to invite Eric to just give a little bit of a highlight um, on how uh, the selection process is going on uh, for the people that will be able to attend the in-person training of trainers. It's mainly a training of trainers. However, um, all students will have an opportunity to actually go through the entire Entire training process um, immediately after that workshop. However, we'll have just you know a few students that have been very proactive in this exercise, um, in attending these remote trainings, and um, 
on other different uh, performance indicators to attend the training in Arusha. Um, and of course, the community engagement. Um, I think uh, Rory's presentation has given us a challenge uh, to start thinking about our communities mentally um, and spatially, not just to wait for the farmers to think spatially, but ourselves to start thinking spatially and to start um, highlighting some of those communities we would actually want to visit. We may not go to all of them in this project, but who knows um, in the next project and um, any other opportunities to engage um, after the end of this field work um, or in the outcomes of our project, some of you, it could be an interest to actually carry this on as research work um, and improve some of the approaches that we've worked on in this project. So um, if that is something that you would want to build, I would say this is a challenge um, in this moment to start identifying yourself and aligning yourself to that group. Um, and of course, overall, um, all of us, um, it would be very, very amazing and um, interesting to start getting feedback from some of you and, you know, documenting your journey, your progress and lessons learned and setbacks, um, you know, uh, that you've stumbled upon um, through this session or through these sessions. And Youth Mappers is always there um, to share your blogs, to share your stories. So please feel free to write that story and shoot it to the comms. Um, a, a person in Youth Mappers, um, at, uh, the Youth Mappers Steering Committee, and they'll definitely uh, be welcome to share your story um, with the rest of the Youth Mappers Network. Very many other people would want to know um, why is it students in Tanzania doing this project? So um, you, um, the Youth Mappers students in Tanzania, sharing this opportunity and highlighting the lessons and um, some of the um, you know, advantages and lessons other people could pick out of, other students in other countries and other continents could pick out of your project. That would be an amazing thing. Um, I would go ahead and um, hand over the mic to Eric just to highlight um, the next phase um, of our work. I know you have been leading this component um, just to give an overview of what um, students and chapter advisors and those present today um, should expect uh, for their uh, participation for in person, the in-person workshop in Arusha. Eric. Yes, um, thank you so much, Stella. I think you can hear me. Yes. Am I audible? Yeah, awesome, thank you. And yeah, I think you mentioned on um, selection and this may seem like, you know, uh, what about the rest of the chapter members, something like that. But we are in this project, we are trying to um, involve any uh, member from the chapter, like the chapter at large. That's why we have just a few students to represent the chapter. So they will be going to Arusha for a workshop uh, where they will be um, equipped with skills and how they will perform actually the field work. And before doing the field work, we'll have uh, trainings with the students. So they will bring, bring back all the knowledge from Arusha's workshop and back to the chapter. So expect more events that you'll um, have more clear understanding on projects and how you can uh, be involved in the chapters. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, the power of selection was uh, rest upon the chapter, chapters themselves. And I, I have had good news that they have gone through that and we'll be sharing um some um names for instance for those who will be uh joining uh, us in uh, in Arusha for the workshop but yeah i think we will be sharing that and for those who are actually who have been selected congratulations and um yeah as i said chapter members you should, you are still involved in the project and looking forward to engage you with you after the workshop Another thing is uh, the community perspective. And I want to share this with the chapters that are really uh, involved directly in this project. That's uh, the chapters in Mwanza, Dodoma, and Arusha. We have heard of many amazing chapters in Tanzania, but uh, some of them were not even in these places. But you guys in these uh, uh, regions, you can take this as an opportunity for you to raise up your voices and bring up uh, challenges in your communities after this project. And yeah, uh, happy to hear more active chapters coming from the Doma ones like Arusha in the maybe three or uh, four months. So thank you so much, Sarah. I don't want to us all the time, but yeah, feel free to 
communicate in the group and I would love to get in touch with you all. Thank you, Stella. Yes. Thank you so much, Eric. Yeah, for sure. I'm really, really curious and looking forward to look at um, all those members taking um, the different niche in remote mapping and field mapping and community engagement exercise. And I would really um, love to like pick on your knowledge and um, your understanding on how you believe um, we could do some of this work uh, very efficiently and sustainably. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you all so much. Um, um, IRDP um, and University of Dodoma, I know um, that attended in classrooms. Uh, thank you so much. And for every individual that joined online um, and our Youth Mappers supporters, Janet, um, I'm not sure of any other teams that are present, but thank you so much uh, for being a part of this series of learning. Yes, Dr. Makaska, your hand is up. I would like us to virtually clap for Stella Morris, who has spent a lot of time organizing these early in the morning. Could we all virtually give her a round of applause? please. Yay. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, have a blessed afternoon um, for everybody outside of the US and a good day for everyone in the US. Um, I'll definitely share all the slide information as usual in the recording. Um, so uh, keep your eyes out and of course more information will keep coming so keep those engagements coming we love to learn about them and see those pictures we we'll, we should also be receiving the blogs as well bye 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 bye, bye. bye.